All right, welcome everyone to the third webinar of the 2015 IGNIS series. Um, we're delighted to have you all join us today. IGNIS is the Latin word for spark or ignite, and that's exactly what we're hoping to do today, to ignite your curiosity and to expose you to opportunities for new understanding and sharing knowledge. So you're here today for universal design for learners. And um, this series is brought to you by the SBCTC eLearning and Assessment Teaching and Learning Offices. And your hosts today are myself, um, Alyssa Sells, and I'm an, an eLearning Program Administrator at the State Board. And normally my counterpart, Jennifer Wetham, joins us, and she is a Program Administrator for Faculty de Development at the State Board. And Jen is away at a conference today in Florida, and she was planning to join us, but she is having a little bit of trouble with her internet. So um, we may not see her today, but in her place, uh, Jerry Lewis from Columbia Basin College has kindly uh, um, agreed to assist in co-moderation. So um, Jerry's here as a backup. Hi, Jerry. Thank you. Let's all give Jerry some applause here because um, I really appreciate him filling in at the last second. All right. Um, so before we start, start, I'd like to just take this opportunity to say thank you to today's presenter, Al Suma, for sharing his expertise in the area of universal design for instruction, and we'll introduce Al to you here in just a second. We're going to get started today by running through a few of the Collaborate tools and doing um, just a few little group activities just to get you familiar with the tools. And then we will go ahead and move on into um, Al's presentation. I am going to paste the link to the ATL blog into our chat window here. And that's where you can find the full IGNIS schedule, and that's where you can access the session descriptions, and also where you can find all of the resources and recordings from each of our webinars. So um, we'll get today's recording posted um, probably tomorrow sometime. So if you have a coworker who or a colleague who's missing out and would like to tune in later, please feel free to share that link with them. All right, uh, let's go ahead and go through a few of our slides here. Okay, hopefully you've all had a chance to test your audio. And um, we are set to four sim simultaneous speakers today, so um, you might need to wait your turn to speak, just as an FYI. Al and I both have our microphones turned on right now, so you can see those little microphone icons there. This is the meeting interface. You can take a quick peek at our tools. We've got the whiteboard area. That's where you're seeing our slides right now. There's a skinny little toolbar in between um, the whiteboard and the other panels, and we're going to be using that toolbar, and I'll explain that in just one second. At the top, you have your audio video. You should be seeing a picture of me there right now. For anyone who has their camera turned on, um, that's where your um, face would display. Um, let's see, in the middle there we have our participants panel. You can scroll through there and see who all is joining us today. And at the very bottom left we have our chat window, so feel free to type comments in there as we go. All right, moving on. So our participant tools, um, if you look just um, below your name, um, you'll see that there are some emoticons. Um, you can raise your hand. There's a polling feature. I'll explain that in a second. Um, your talk button's on when your little blue microphone is showing. You can also step away from a session if you need to, and it will show you as away. All right, here's our chat window. Again, please feel free to type questions and comments into the chat as we go, and we'll visit those during Al's presentation. And our first, oops, sorry, I forgot to silence my cell phone. You can hear me ringing in the background. All right, so I uh, turned my cell phone off. Good. Um, there's a good moderating tip for anyone who's going to moderate a collaborate webinar. Um, turn your cell phone off before you start. OK, so we are on our whiteboard tools. This is a practice slide. What I'd like you to do is um, hover over the um, tool that is your pointer and select a pointing tool. You can practice here. It's that little sun icon right between the whiteboard and the, the participants panel. And you can practice here. 
I'm going to select the sun and I'll just put a sunshine here. We are going to use this tool on the next slide, so please take this opportunity to practice. Okay, great. Looks like you guys are a quick study and have already gotten the hang of it. I see a few of you are having some audio delay, so um, hopefully you'll get caught up here pretty quick. All right, on this slide, we are going to show where we are located. I'm in Washington, as most of you probably are. We did switch out a few weeks ago to a state map um, of the whole US because our presenter was joining us from a different state. And Jen was going to join us today from sunny Florida, but I don't think she's been able to log in just yet. So um, go ahead and put your dots there. I see a lot of you, or most of us, are in Washington today. I did just notice today that my um, map is not completely in English, um, even though it is an open resource. So um, if you'll notice, there's some odd spellings of a few things on our map. I thought that was kind of funny. All right, um, our next activity is to get familiar using the polling tool. And um, it's that little a or a check mark. Actually, it's a check mark right now. Let me change that real quick because I forgot to um, put it on multiple choice. So um, should be on multiple choice now. You should see an A there. And I see that I have a typo. This is three weeks in a row that I've had a typo on one of my slides. It's starting to make me grumpy. All right, so our question for today is, how familiar are you with universal design for learning? Click A if you want to know more, you've heard of it, but you're unsure how to apply it. B for you're working on it, you're using some of the UDL principles in your teaching. And C if you're an expert, you've fully integrated UDL principles into your course. So I'm going to go ahead and click my answer, and then I'm going to publish the results to the um, window here so that we can see our responses. There we go. So um, a lot of people are kind of in that mid-range of working on it. They might be familiar and using some of it. So that's great. Kind of just gauging where our audience is on this topic. All right. Just some quick meeting etiquette for you. Um, please raise your hand before you speak if you'd like to be called on. And um, that'll let us know which order the questions were asked in. That's that little tiny hand um, icon that you see in the participants panel. Please feel free to use your emoticons to indicate a job well done or if you agree with something. Um, your talk button is on. If you have your talk button clicked and you see the blue microphone, please click your talk button off. Uh, when you're not speaking, because we are only set to four speakers, and we do have um, we do hear background noise, so um, make sure that you're sensitive of that. And then that chat box there, go ahead and type your questions and raise your hand um, during the presentation. So um, a little different thing this time. Normally, we have you hold your questions to the end of the presentation, and we do a Q&A at the end. Um, our presenter today would prefer if you raise your hands and make comments and ask questions during the presentation. So please feel free to go ahead and interrupt if you have um, something you'd, you'd like to ask. All right, that was my timer, and I was almost right on today. So um, today, we are talking about universal design for learners and best practices in the classroom. And we are joined by our presenter, Al Suma, from um, Seattle Central Community College. And he is a counselor and provides disability support services there. So Al, I will go ahead and get to your first slide and hand it over to you. And I will set you um, a timer. And um, you can take it away. Thank you, Alyssa. And I want to thank you for helping me set this up. Um, this technology is, is a little bit new to me, so I, I do appreciate that. And to Jennifer also. And yeah, no worries. I guess, I'm sorry, I guess we should probably thank Doug Romine, too, for doing the behind the scenes help for you. Um, let's give him some kudos and some applause before you get started. So, yay, Doug. All right, Al, take it away. Yes, thank you. Hello, colleagues, and, and, and thanks for joining us today for this next hour. I appreciate your, your interest in this topic. Um, my, my normal practice is face-to-face is -face and in, when I give these talks. And I, as Alyssa mentioned, I enjoy when people just interrupt me and put their hands up and ask a question, as opposed to waiting to the end. So again, I want to reiterate that if you please have any questions or comments. I see a number of you have some 
experience in UDI also, and I want you to uh, please add to the conversation. That would make you very happy. Just briefly about myself, I've been working here at Seattle Central for 24 years now, and I work in disability support services. My interest in this whole topic of universal design has really been as a result of my students coming to me on a daily basis, frustrated with not being able to get the information they need to get for a variety of reasons. Many of my students have a learning disability or may have ADD or could be a head injury or a number of other disabilities. But for whatever reason, the style of the teacher hasn't often matched their learning. And that's where the problem has come in. So I took an interest in this topic. And as a result, for the last 10 years or so, have been studying universal design. So I hope to share some basic ideas. And I want you to walk away with something you can use in your toolbox after this hour. And I'm hoping that's the case. So I'm going to move my slide here and just briefly describe what universal design is. It's just a way of designing products or environments so that more people could use it. On the simplest level, that's what it is. And then some people began thinking, well, if we do that with our environment, like the curb cut you see in front of you there, perhaps we could do it with instruction. Perhaps we could design our teaching methods so that more people could use it with very little adopt, uh, adaption or specialized design. And so we call that UDI, Universal Design of Instruction. And this ramp that you see here in front of you it was meant actually for wheelchair users originally, but as you know, many people are using this. Skateboarders, people pushing baby carriages, um, people using it to, to pull uh, luggage up, and so forth and so forth. So it has multiple purposes. And that's the goal here, is to design your classroom in a way that has multiple purposes and more people uh, will be reached. Benefits include the following. Um, ways to reach diverse learners, more ways. Um, multimodal teaching. Flexibility. The third point here, offering flexibility, that's a key word. Being flexible in how you present your information, how you assess the knowledge that you want your students to have. Those are critical things. Um, the fourth point is having other ways to demonstrate knowledge. You know, it seems to me that so many individuals are still teaching, I call it the old way, but maybe I'm being too judgmental here, but they're still teaching in a way that the paper and pencil test, midterm, final, maybe a few quizzes in between. And a student's entire grade is determined by those two tests or quizzes. And if you're not a good test taker, you're really out of luck. So hopefully today we'll explore a few other ideas. And um, again, I know many of you in this chat room here have interesting things you're doing. I definitely want to hear that, please. And finally, minimizing the need for special accommodations. In my role here at South Central, I set up accommodations with faculty. But I'm hoping that as people begin to use universal design more, then we'll need less accommodations. The only reason we have accommodations is because there's just one way of doing business. And if it doesn't fit that, then we have to change things around. There are exceptions to that, like interpreters for the deaf will always um, most likely be needed. Um, but there are many students we can reach using these other uh, uh, assessment tools uh, that will benefit, as well as individuals who are deaf. All right, moving along. Um, this is like a repeat slide. I apologize for that. OK, so the objective here is to find flexible ways to deliver the information you want to deliver, flexibility in assessing student progress 
and flexibility in creating classroom assignments. That's our, our hope here. So who will benefit? Students with different learning styles, non-native users, non-native language users, students with disabilities or different abilities, individuals with different backgrounds and experiences, and returning older students. So as you can see, it does reach a, a wider range than your traditional student straight out of a high school who's coming to college you know, for the first time. As I was thinking about this presentation, I wanted to break it down to three simple points. How you present the information, again. How you engage students. And how you assess what you taught them. In the simplest form, those are, that's how I see teaching. OK. so. Historically, I think you'll all agree that most of the instructors we had growing up probably stood in front of a classroom, for the most part, and um, gave straight lectures. But if you're not an auditory learner, you're really out of luck. Or if you're a person who daydreams frequently or gets distracted easily by sounds, outside sounds, inside classroom sounds, then again, you're, you're distracted and you may not be getting all the information. So I'd like to throw out some ideas here. This slide and the next slide will give you some ideas. And then I'll ask you if you have other things you're doing besides these things. Lectures, traditional. Films. I find that faculty here at my college are using a lot of films these days and um, getting good results with that. PowerPoints, of course, social media, Canvas. That's our platform for. Um, uh, working with students, simulations, field trips, outside speakers. I recently did a class um, last week, and I had three outside speakers, and it really worked out well. Um, written summary of key concepts. Now, I'll, I'll get back to that one. That's a good one. Basically, in a nutshell, what that means is write um, before your class, if you can write some key concepts on a blackboard, that could be helpful. Use of visual aids, um, recommending outside visits or lectures to museums and plays, that sort of thing. OK, those are some suggestions. So let me stop here and ask um, if there are things that others are doing that I could add to this. So maybe next time I give this talk, I could add some other ideas. There are things that um, you find yourself discovering recently that that's not on this list. Go ahead and raise your hands, folks, and we'll call on you. Or go ahead and type those into the chat. To get us started, Al, um, I'll just mention that in my work on Project IDEA, that in addition to the text that went on pages, we also used the inline audio feature in Canvas so students could listen to the audio and read along so they could choose what they wanted or they could do both at the same time. Mm, interesting. Yes. Yes, Canvas has more capabilities than I'm aware of myself. I'm just getting used to it as a faculty member here. But um, yeah. wow, OK, Liz at right um, Renton Technical College says she uses Google Docs and Canvas collaborations. And Connie from uh, Spokane Falls Community Colleges says she uses flashcards. Um, Liz contributed another one. She says tic-tac-toe. And Deneen says that she's using websites. Exactly great. Yes, um, just a comment about the flashcards. I like that idea a lot. I know my students in the science majors, the science classes, like physiology, the now of physiology, those classes, they use different color flashcards to go with specific um, parts of the body, or maybe like all the things related to bones would be one color. Things related to blood and vessels and those things are different color. So I like the flashcards. I just want to sort of uh, support that and, and even a little bit further using uh, colored uh, flashcards. Good ideas. Thank you, guys.
engaging students. Again, uh, traditional ways of teaching suggest that we simply give the lecture, students take notes, and maybe ask some questions, but that's about the extent of it. Here at South Central, and I'm sure at most of the colleges now, we're doing a lot more classroom participation, a lot more group projects. Even our math uh, classes have been done in group projects where you come up with one answer and you have four students together. Um, student panels. I like student panels. Sometimes what I do in my classes, I'll give a, I'll present a problem. And I'll, ha I'll ask one group of students to present the pros, another group the opposite position. And that creates a lot of research on their part and, and some interesting discussions. Again, the idea is to engage students in a way that makes it accessible to them. Because people remember um, uh, group work, and they remember panels, they remember that in a different way that they might remember a straight lecture. Learning communities are really big at my school too, and uh, uh, students often come back to me and say, oh, I love that uh, coordinated studies program I'm in. It's so fascinating. We're making, we're doing projects and we're making masks and we're doing different things like that. It uses a kinesthetic um, way of teaching also. So let me, let me I'll ask you guys if there's something that I'm missing here that you're doing in terms of engaging students that you don't see on this slide right here. I like these ideas that you throw out so I can make sure I use them next time. So I'll start us off with a okay. comment. Um, okay. I've used an act activity called um, Ask Someone Who Knows to get students to participate with each other and engage in the content and engage with each other. And um, I've used it in a flipped classroom where the students would prepare ahead of time. And then they come back to class, and I would give them a handout that had a grid on it, and it had questions in it related to the content that they had just learned. And then they had to go around the room and engage with other students by asking um, someone who knew the answer. But you could only ask the same student one question. So you'd have to continually move around the room because one student couldn't keep answering questions for, um, for you. So it was a good way to get the class mixed. They really seemed to enjoy it. Um, let's see, let's check our comments here. Um, still talking about some flashcards. Yes, uh, flashcards, carrying those around. That is handy. Um, Ellen from um, Spokane, I think, SSC. Um, she says she's interested in effective rubrics for um, these types of activities. I'm not sure if she was referring to uh, flashcards or what you're talking about here. Jerry put in a link um, for everyone to a different um, flashcard um, product. I had suggested Quizlet. And um, Connie from Spokane Falls says she gets students to work in teams of two as neighbors. And then after that, they share. And then they join in with another set of neighbors to create a neighborhood. That sounds, Connie, a lot like an activity I've used called, called a snowball discussion. Um, sounds real familiar. Uh, Liz had a comment about rubrics, um, making them more open-ended, complete or incomplete, and asking for feedback. And then um, Kelly at CPTC says, um, I have a Q&A discussion set up as ask someone who knows um, in all of um, all my classes says it, and says it works great. So um, looks like some good activities out there. Anyone else want to share? Go uh, ahead and raise your hand. Go ahead, Al. Excellent ideas. Excellent. I'll just comment on one. I like the idea where you get two students working together, then they expand to maybe four students, and they expand their knowledge, then six students. That's a great idea. I think I heard her say that was like a neighborhood, creating a neighborhood. Very good. Very nice. And the other ones also. I like it. So it's not like people are engaging students in multiple ways. And uh, it's nice to hear that. OK, I'll move on. Assessing knowledge. Well, that slide you see in the, on that, that picture you see on the right-hand side, things in the course, things I studied, and things on the exam. This is finals week right here on my campus. And I cannot tell you how many times students say that to me. In the beginning, I used to think, 
maybe they're just not studying it right. But I've heard so many stories about this. I'm just beginning to wonder if maybe what the, some teachers are teaching may not be exactly what they're putting on the exam. I don't know. But I've heard it more than once. And um, so I'm a little concerned about that. But I was thinking, rather than final exams, midterms, as the sole reason, the sole tool for assessing knowledge, if we might want to expand a little bit on how we ex assess knowledge. Of course, papers, they've been around for a long time, nothing really new there. PowerPoint presentations, I find that some of my students are really great at creating PowerPoint presentations and really do a fine job. Um, group presentations have been around for a while, nothing new there. Team assignments, always a good thing, I think. Posters, creating posters and having students explain um, which, which the ideas behind the posters. Role playing, games, uh, Jeopardy is a popular one. I know a lot of uh, people use Jeopardy to take their area of expertise, whether it's history or science or whatever it is. And you know, for 100 points, $100, then you pick a category. In addition to those ways of assessing knowledge, case studies. I enjoy case studies, particularly I teach a class on um, history of disabilities. And I like to look at different situations and different case studies. Individual group projects, portfolios, that's I think fairly new. Um, where you ask students to put together a collection of the work they've been doing all quarter. And I'd be interested in hearing those of you in this on this um, webinar. If you guys are doing that, I want to hear a little bit about that. I love that uh, that one, portfolios. And testing people in pairs or groups. Take home tests where people have to spend more time um, obtaining knowledge. Again, the point here really is that there are other ways to get the information that you want. And some of my students, just some of our students, just don't do well on a traditional pen and paper tests, and I have a lot of students. Another thing, too, about paper tests and, and so forth is that it's an art to create a good test. There really is an art to that. And if you're not good at that, or if you don't, haven't done it before, you can make a lot of very basic mistakes. Anyway, so tell me, um, this is a, a pretty good list of ways, but are there other ways that I missed here that you guys are doing? Or is someone doing portfolios, for example? If so, how is that working out? Uh, Liz mentioned in the chat that she's using the ePortfolio function in um, Canvas. And Joyce mm -hmm. Carroll from Bellevue College says, how about poetry, music, or painting? Those are three I don't think I would have thought of. And Jerry Lewis from uh, Columbia Basin says formative versus summative assessments. I see. Very good. Yes, um, the music. I haven't thought of that, actually. And I'm just wondering if where she's using that, like what class, what's the topic on that I'm class? not sure. Let's ask but her. I, but I like that. I like that idea. So what, yeah, what do you teach? What class do you teach that would allow that? Okay, I'm not sure. I'm not seeing a talk button for Joyce. Um, but she okay. looks like okay. she's typing into the chat right now. So um, we should have something from her here in a second. Um, yeah. While we're And Jerry's idea of formative and summative is, is also, I like that. It's linked. I like it very right. much. And while we're waiting for Joyce to weigh in a little further on the music topic, I'll read a few other ones that are here. Uh, Ellen says, okay. um, use lots of group projects and portfolio uh, for technical fields. Measuring and assessment is a challenge. Uh, Connie says, I have students share pictures or photographs um, to share their, their visual of a concept. And Janine says, uh, students developed projects designed uh, to teach others the concepts or ideas from class. She says usually posters. Um, so that's, um, that's kind of neat, having the students teach um, yeah. each other. Yes. I, well, I want to just back up. You said something about um, someone does vi visuals. 
they have students that present visuals? Uh, um, they present their pictures to each other to visually communicate. To each other. Uh, yeah, to communicate their content. You know, one of the I like that. One of the things that my students often tell me is that they think in terms of pictures. Not all my students, but I've had a number of students do that to me, where an instructor would be given a lecture, and they create in their mind these pictures. And they, they're very strong in that sort of frame of mind. And so to allow a student who thinks that way to present their knowledge that way, it's just a really flexible and a wonderful um, approach. I like that. So thank you for that. All right. Joyce has typed in. She says, um, music could be utilized in cases where you have hard to reach students who may have a talent or strong interest in music video or video making. Uh, dev ed is our primary area where these activities are encouraged. I see. OK. Yes. You know, I, I, I teach a class on disability studies, and uh, one of the topics we talk about is the environment, how to create the environment in a way that is accessible to more people. And I had a student do his uh, final uh, presentation uh, on a video that he created. He was a skateboarder, and he was skating around town and showing where things were and were not accessible for, for wheelchair users and so forth. So I like that. Um, that creative sign. And with a lot of students now using their MacBook and other devices where they can create films and videos so much easier than it used to be in the old days, um, this is going to be, a, I think, an up and coming technique uh, assessment method for people in the future. I really believe that. Um, we, do, we do have Any a question. Uh, okay. Energy Carol says, um, what about older, hard of hearing students? Do we have any uh, recommendations for um, that group of students? Yes. OK, so um, there's a couple of problems. First, let's identify what the problem is with the older, hard of hearing. The problem is they don't always hit a lecture, obviously. And so the solution historically has been to put the student um, as close to the front as possible or the, quote, good ear closer to the, um, the faculty as possible. And that still remains a good idea. But one thing I do in my class for universal design technique is I have a universal note taker. So the idea behind that is I get one or two, sometimes two, um, individuals who agree ahead of time to take notes for the entire class. Uh, because many students are poor note takers. And if you're hard of hearing, then you may miss a lot of the notes. And so I have two students agree to take notes. Now, the rest of the class can take their own notes. That's fine. No, there's nothing wrong with that. But they don't have to. The students who take the notes at the end of the class submit the notes to me. And I, I double check them for accuracy. And then I put them up on a web or um, send them out to all the students in some, some format of some sort. So all the students have them. I've gotten some kind of negative feedback from other faculty about that technique when I suggested it. Some faculty feel like, wow, you're not teaching students how to take notes. And my response is, no, I'm not. I'm teaching disability studies class. You're teaching a history class. Someone's teaching a science class. We're not teaching note takers. So why are we trying to force students who don't take good notes to learn in your history class or science class to take good notes? So I like the idea of a universal note taker where um, all the students get the notes, whether you can hear well or not hear well. So that's my approach to, to Ricker. And I had a student just like that, actually, um, this weekend in my class. He's an older gentleman, actually. He sat right up in front, but he still missed um, a number of things. The other thing I do, this is my own style, I always repeat questions. Whenever a student asks me a question, I repeat it for two reasons. One is I want to be sure I heard what the question is correctly. So I repeat it, and the student can say, oh, no, no, I meant this or that, whatever. And number two, for those other students who are sitting away in the back or sitting on the side or wherever they're sitting who maybe didn't catch it. And um, I have TAs that work with me sometimes. And I always uh, ask them to make that part of their habit in my classroom to repeat all questions. Good question. Thank you very much.
Other questions at this point before going any further about assessing knowledge? Again, I just want to say that so many of my students complain about the old paper and pencil thing. It's just like doesn't work for a lot of students, especially multiple choice questions where they're so close to each other, and then people throw tricky questions in there. I don't know why people do that. There's, there's so many uh, traps involved with, with these traditional methods. Now, it doesn't mean that you can never do it or that it doesn't have a place, but if it's a steady diet of, of assessing knowledge, mm, I might question that. Alyssa, any questions that you hear, see there? No? Um, sometimes I have students that I do one-on-one -on -one exams. It's kind of rare, but it happens. I have, a I have several students who have high anxiety. I imagine you guys have a lot of anxiety students, too, who cannot do class presentations. And so I will um, allow them to do a one-on-one. -on -one. I'll ask my faculty if they'll consider that. And most faculty agree with that. Um, the other thing, too, I'd like to encourage you, if you could just bring yourself to, to accept this idea that why not allow formulas, notes, quick references, index cards, whatever, whatever you have for students in the exams themselves? Because in reality, they'll probably have access to that anyways. Um, so if you have the formula, particularly in math, I don't want to go on about math, but that's a long story about math. I mean, we know that we lose a lot of students in that area um, who don't get through math. And I see, I go through a lot of tissues from my box here, tissue box, tears that people are crying over that particular topic. And sometimes I like to encourage my faculty to allow formulas for everyone, not just for my students, but for all students. Um, any other comments about assessing knowledge in multiple ways? Maybe I missed something. Or maybe you have a question. We have a comment that says uh, from Energy Carol. She says, I agree with open book, open note. Uh, they have to know at least where mm. the information is. And um, mm. I was just typing something in. I was making a comment of my own uh, that I allowed my students to use a handwritten study guide that they would prepare ahead of time. And um, it was just a one pager. They could put whatever they wanted on it. And um, it had to be handwritten. And um, in that, like, not, at, you know, their own handwriting. I did, I did make a, a few exceptions occasionally. Um, but anybody who really took the time to put that together didn't really end up needing it for the quiz. But it was a comfort for a lot of students. So um, I do agree with the open notes, open, open quiz philosophy. Yes, you know, very good. Thank you for saying that. I, I used to think that what open book, take home test, all that kind of stuff was really odd. But now I really come to believe that it's very effective. Students really have to dig for that information, and that could take them even more time to finish a test. Actually, so yeah, thanks for sharing. Yeah, that. and then um, Bomb at Tech E Learning Lab says it should be about application instead of memorization, and I can't agree more. I think that's right along with what you're saying. God, yes, that's yeah. exact. Thank you very much for that saying that. Particularly my students with head injuries, and I have a number of students with head injuries, and I'm sure you do too. Maybe you don't know it. It's one of those invisible disabilities. But one of the problems with head injuries is memory. And school is so many classes are about memorizing this, memorizing that. But your idea about application, Bob, is really good. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so let me say something about one of the principles of universal design is creating a welcoming environment. Um, so you're setting a tone for the class, and that means so much. Many, many students over the years have come to me and have said, you know, I'm so nervous about school. I'm so anxious. Because students come to us, what I call loaded. When I say loaded, I mean they come to us with a tremendous amount of experiences, oftentimes negative, with instructors. For example, just last week a student came to me. And she was telling me a story about when she was in the fourth grade in a math class. She went to the blackboard and she had to answer a multiplication table uh, question. Multiplication question. She couldn't do it, but the teacher would not allow her to sit down until she got it right. And there she was at the blackboard, thirty sets of eyes, 
just like a laser beam on her back. Her anxiety was going up so much. Today, she's 26. She cannot go to a blackboard. So you can remember, she was describing what she was wearing, what the teacher was wearing, the smells in the room. She remembered so much. It was just imprinted on her so strongly. That's one example. And there are many, many other examples people have given me. But the point is that what happens is students come to us with these memories. And although they have nothing to do with you, you are not the teacher. They bring it into the classroom. So if you can create a, uh, a tone, um, that makes all the difference in the world to many students. And just a really quick short story again. I just want to share this one because this one's a powerful one, I think. A student came to me one day, and she already picked out her classes. And I saw on that that she picked this particular teacher who I would not have recommended. He did not have a good reputation um, in the past. He's not here anymore, but he didn't have a good reputation. And, and students often drop out of his class for a lot of reasons. But she, she, had him, she picked him. She didn't know anything about that. I didn't say anything. I said, oh, OK, well, I won't wish you well. And two weeks later, she came back. And um, I was really curious about how she was doing that class. I said, how are your classes going? She said, oh, yeah, my math class, my favorite class. I thought to myself, what? That's her favorite class. So I, mean, I didn't let her know my astonishment, of course. But I said, well, tell me a little bit. What is it about that teacher you like? She said to me, he was the first teacher ever to remember my name. He called me by my name. Wow. I thought. It's amazing. That little thing really made a difference for her. Now I come to realize that sometimes it's the smallest things we do that have the biggest impact. Yeah, using a student's name can mean so much. Um, I know I use classroom icebreakers. I'll just name one that I use. and I'll, Then I'll ask you what you use. But I use one where I call it common ground. So I can do it with you guys right now. I want to find common ground. Put your hand up. I want to find common ground with someone in this this webinar who has been to Venice, Italy. Go ahead and click on your hand button if you have been to Venice, Italy. All right, we've got a few takers. Okay, so I'm in the classroom, so I say something like that, and um, and I might call on Energy Carol or Marianne, uh, one of those two, to say. OK, tell me briefly. And they'll say, yeah, I went there last summer with my parents, or whatever I did. <laughs> and then they have, then it's their turn. And they say, I want to find common ground with someone who has six brothers, or something like that, or raises bloodhounds, or whatever. And then other people raise their hands. And then it's their turn. And then before you know it, at the end of the class, we all have some common ground. We've all either been someplace, or have so many siblings, or Whatever it is, have certain pets. Could be on any topic. So that's what I use. I call it common ground. I can't remember where I got it from. I got it years ago from somebody. Is there a simple one that you guys like to use to break the ice? I mean, you can look up too. You can Google common. I mean, you can uh, icebreakers in a the classroom. There are a lot of them out there, but students seem to like it. They get less nervous, reduces their anxiety a bit. While we're waiting for people to weigh in on that, I'll just go ahead and throw mine out there. Uh, the one that I use in my classroom is uh, Two Truths and a Lie. And it's um, an online class, so it's done um, through a Canvas discussion board. And you try to weave in something interesting, facts about yourself, give a couple of things that are true, and give one falsehood. And then you have everybody go back and guess at what your lie is. It, it's kind of a fun little exercise, and, and the students seem to uh, enjoy it. So does anyone else have one they'd like to share? Alyssa, I'll just say that my TA introduced me to that just this past uh, weekend. Yeah, it's Which fun. Lie. I never heard of it before, but uh, uh, we didn't use it because I think it would take a little more time yeah. than mine would. But actually, I, I like the idea. I like the idea. Okay, we have a comment from Energy Carol. She has one called, Who Wears a Watch? And she has another one called, May I Have mm. Your Autograph, Please? I've not ever heard of those. Maybe, uh, Carol, could you type a few more things in? Or if you have audio today, would you mind raising your hand? We'll call on you to speak. 
Yeah. Who wears a watch? Uh, okay, yeah, Bellingham Tech that. says, leave the classroom and go outside. <laughs> That's an icebreaker. Uh, Noreen says, a bit silly, but adults seem to love it. <laughs> I ask them to introduce themselves and then tell us what they wanted to be when they grew up, when they were five years old. Fun oh. to hear people say they were going to be a race car driver or a cowboy or a teacher. Um, and then Joyce from Bellevue, she says, big wind blows or whip around. I have not heard of either of those either. Wow. Well, there's so many of them out there. It's really interesting to me there's that many. But I like the, I like the one also um, about tell me what you're going to be, what you wanted to be when you were young. There's something personal about that, but not too intimate. And that's, that's the idea, to find something personable but not too, too close to the vest. And I like that a lot. All right. Are you getting any more feedback there? Um, if not, I'll move uh, on. Just a comment from Carol. She says, nobody wears a watch anymore. How do they tell time? How big is oh, the yeah. watch? It gets really funny, she says. I see, I see. <laughs> That's true. No one does wear watches much anymore. That's right. So yeah, I think you're good to move on. OK. All right, so some basic, just basic everyday things. And I apologize if it's too basic, but you'd be surprised how many people break these rules. Speak clearly. That's something I have to work on myself. I'm from Boston, and I tend to speak a little faster than most people. Um, here's an interesting one, second one. How you use your voice for emphasis, contrast, and exaggeration. I tend to do that. I like doing that. Um, it works for me, but I had a speaker this past weekend in my class who came in and his voice was total monotone, total. It really bored me, and I didn't tell him this, of course, but you know, thankfully he came in, but his voice was, it just had no inflection, no emphasis. It was straight talk. I can imagine if you're teaching for a whole hour or whatever it is that but I could put people to sleep or tune people out. And facial expressions, I think, are important, too. A big one, people, the rule they break is they talk to the blackboard. So someone asked earlier about a hard of hearing student. Yeah, that's really a difficult one for a hard of hearing student, talking to the blackboard with your back towards the students. And I've seen professors so excited about their content, they're writing like crazy on a blackboard, and they're talking to the blackboard at the same time. I always check my back row of students. Can you hear me back there? I get a show of hands, or I don't. So it gives me an idea how to adjust my, my volume. Um, you know, one of the issues that's come up time and time again in our classrooms is the issue of civility. It seems like students more so are acting out than it used to be. Now I don't know if um, I don't know if that's accurate based on research, but most likely I bet you'll find a lot of people agreeing with that. I always outline what my expectations of this class. For example, I expect that we'll be civil towards each other. That sometimes we'll have differences of opinions, which is fine. But I, I appreciate uh, civility and I appreciate uh, people respecting each other and accepting each other's point of views. A simple thing like that, and of course. I'd recommend putting the syllabus, too. This is not a class on syllabus. There are classes like that in webinars on how to create a syllabus. But that's one thing I put on my syllabus. And um, I promote interactions between my students. And that's just my style. So those are some universal design basic stuff, basic things. Um, just a few more notes on the syllabus. It's amazing to me how many students come to me and say, Al, I missed my quiz. I don't know what to do. And I always say, look at your syllabus. What's it say? They pull out the syllabus. We'll look at it together. And guess what? Nothing in there about being absent or missing a quiz or an exam or anything, or missing attendance or class behaviors. So again, I want to encourage you to. Um, to include those basic ground rules. Al, I just wanted to mention that we are yeah. at the 10-minute um, mark. 
So we should be wrapping up okay. in about 10 minutes. Um, we might run over a little bit today, folks, because Al has a few um, really great slides left. Um, I'd hate for us to miss out on them, so I'll probably just let him go um, until he's okay. done. If you need to sign out, please go ahead and do that, and you can access the recording later. So move on, Al. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. And, I, and I'll move on a little quicker, too, so that I can get most of it in here. Uh, a good principle before your lecture to write your concepts, terms, and ideas on the board, or if you want to do it in a handout, do it that. So students know what's coming up. I think that's really important. In my class, for example, the other day I was teaching, um, I, had, I had four concepts. I put them on a board. Social constructs, social justice model of disability, the medical model of disability, and the charity model of disability. I just wrote them on a board, and then as I went through my lecture, I pointed to it and said, okay, now I'm talking about the social justice model. Very nice. Students love that. It's so clear. I start each lecture with an overview of the objectives. And I know someone on this um, webinar said they have study, guide, study guides and handouts. Great thing. that has key terms on it and concepts. And then I'd like to present two or three questions that you should be able to answer at the end of my lecture. I, I put them on a board or I say them out loud. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to define what the charity model is and who in our history used that extensively in the media. So good suggestions, I hope. Um, other things, choosing textbooks. Uh, you know, people come to you selling these textbooks and um, there's a slide coming up I want to show you that I think you might really find helpful. But when you choose a textbook, pick one that's designed in a way that makes it easier to understand. And you know, it's hard for me to tell you what that book looks like, but you know and I know that when we see that book, oh yeah, oh yeah, things are highlighted, there's some pictures on the side, um, things are bolded in a certain way. You know what I'm talking about. So be careful when you pick your textbooks. Assign a class note taker. That's what I do, like I mentioned earlier, a universal note taker. Use your use caption videos and DVDs. You know, that's really important. Not just for individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing, but for people who may be from other countries who don't get the language as quickly. Or the speaker in a DVD may, or a video may not speak clearly. And I know that when I use caption, it helps me myself. So. Uh, I always tell my students where they get tutoring, where the writing center is. Uh, oh, the last one here. Here's a common mistake people make. Get this now. Picture this. It's the end of the class. People are putting their stuff in their bags. And you, as a teacher, shout out. By the way, everybody, um, there'll be a quiz um, next Tuesday on chapters 6 and 7, OK? Everyone's moving and getting ready to leave. And you thought, well, I shouted it out. Everyone should get it. No. It doesn't work like that. For a lot of students, do not get that. So just a word of warning. Getting back to the publisher. So um, here's a really nice slide, I think. And I give um, thanks to uh, Jess Thompson. She's out of Olympic College who put this together for my professional organization that I really appreciate it. And so if you look at that, get some good ideas. When you talk to your publisher representatives, hey, OK, I'll buy you a book, but is it accessible? And here are some ways that you could um, help explain to him or her what accessibility is. Um, best practice for exams. I have a faculty member here. She gave me this idea. I like it. The class's first quiz is a day after, the second day of school. And it's on the syllabus. Anybody else do that here? Anybody in this room do that? Make your first quiz about the syllabus. In other words, the quiz might be like, how many tests will be in this classroom? When is your major paper due? What's my policy on missing quizzes? What's my policy on attendance? Does anybody in this um, uh, chat room do that? That's a great idea. I like that idea. Um, 
explain how to study for your exams. That's so critical. Students come to me every day and say, you know, I'm not sure what he or she is looking for. I say, well, did you ask? Create study questions or study guides. A few people here mentioned they do that. Very good. Give out sample test questions and give out the answers to those. So many students are just up in the air. I have no idea how she tests. I have no idea. And by giving out a sample test questions and answers, well, that gives them a little bit of idea. Nothing wrong with that. Um, some more ideas about exams. I'll just, I'll just pick out one here that I think is good, um, really good. Avoid white paper for exams. Why do I say that? Did you know that um, when you have white paper and you have fluorescent lights overhead, that some people with scotopic sensitivity, it's called, um, actually the words move around on the paper. They literally move around when they look at it because of the re reflection of between the fluorescent lights and the white paper. And, um, and many of my students will actually use um, an overlay or they have colored glasses that they use. And of course, match your exams to the content you're teaching. Again, a lot of students have said to me, you know, I studied, but the stuff wasn't on the exam. Any, any comments, real quick comments about this before I go on? Uh, I think you're good. Um, Jerry says okay. it could possibly also um, be due to the frequency of the light, 60 hertz, he says. Ah, yes, that's right. And computers will do that, do that too. Yeah, and I was just that's typing right. a comment that said matching the content to the actual exam, um, that that was an issue for alignment. Yes, yes. All right, so Mythbusters. So if you apply universal design in the classroom, um, it's going to create more work for you. Well, actually, yes, a little bit more, I think, in the beginning. But once you have it designed and you're doing it, really, it's not any more work than normally it would be. I just want to bust that myth. And then some instructors have said to me, and, and these are things that people have actually said to me, that really, um, aren't you just setting it up so everyone gets an A? Well, no, not really. Um, what we're setting it up for is that people have more access to the information you're presenting. That's what we're trying to set up. Now, whether they get an A or a B or a C or a D, whatever they get, they earned what they earn. You still grade it by your academic standards. You don't lower your standards. No, we're not saying that at all. So if someone says that to you, you might just say, no, we're just guaranteeing access. Will it coddle students and spoon feed them? No, no. You can still be rigorous, have really challenging assignments, require a lot of work, whatever you do, whatever your, your expectations for your content are. That doesn't change, not at all. Um, this is an interesting one. So I have a universal note taker, as I mentioned earlier, in my class. So someone said to me, several people actually said to me, wow, really, what you're doing is now you're reinforcing other students to skip your class. Hmm. Well, not necessarily. If I have class requirements, which I do, I have a class attendance requirements, and I build it in to get credit for that, that solves that problem. But really, having notes available to everybody frees them up to listen to what I'm saying. So many students have said to me over the years, Al, I take notes, but the teacher goes further ahead than I'm writing, and I just, I don't know, I'm trying to get the notes down. And so they're missing a good percent of the lecture. I like it when students just pay attention. Just put your pencils down if you want, and just pay attention. Now, other students want to take notes because it helps them kinesthetically. They're taking notes and listening at the same time. It's just it helps them focus. Some people doodle, things like that. But having notes available for everybody, no, it's not reinforcing them this cut class, not really. Uh, and again, I mentioned this earlier, 
you're not teaching note taking, so no, it's not going to prevent them from learning how to take notes. Okay. So, um, in our closing time here, in 24 years I've been here, what I've done was this. I got a lot of complaints about faculty, and I'm faculty, so there are complaints about me, and complaints about my other faculty. And so, in the beginning, I used to think, oh boy, more complaints, really. But then I started listening more deeply, and then I started recording, writing down the common ones. So I have in front of you, you have in front of you um, about, oh, I don't know, uh, 20 or so complaints. These are the most common complaints students have given me. Now, there are many other complaints, but if only once or twice I heard them, I throw them out. These in front of you are ones that are consistently, over and over, come to me. So here it goes, the first one, most common one. The instructor does not return emails. That really burns my students up. Now, I have to be fair to my faculty, because sometimes my students, I'll say to them, well, when did you email? instructor, and they'll say, well, just like two hours ago. <laughs> I said, well, okay, you have to allow some time here. And I, I say to my students, you know, why don't, uh, to my faculty, once you send your syllabus, I return all emails within a 48-hour time period and not on weekends. Ah, now the student knows. Okay, other complaints. Um, syllabus is confusing. I can't keep up taking notes. Poor handwriting. Oh, this one's a good one, a big one. The number of questions in the exam is too much to finish within the allotted time. I hear that a lot. So I throw this out to you, and maybe these aren't your problems, fine. Or maybe you might see yourself here, maybe. Um, the third one here, my entire grade is dependent on a midterm or final. That's a hard one. That drives a lot of students crazy. I'm unable to catch verbal information when other students get up and leave at the end of class. Again, don't shout out. Or the entire class is teacher lecturing. These are very common complaints, again, that my students have uh, shared with me over the years. And again, these are very, very common. Um, so if they miss class for legitimate reasons, they have the flu, which most people have, they missed the notes. But again, having a universal note taker, that would solve that. Um, students don't like it when they get no feedback on assignment on their papers. Nothing. Nothing's written. Maybe a check mark. Maybe that's it. Uh, the rules about makeup exams, that's big. Oh, I have no idea what the test will look like. That's an anxiety producing thing. And it doesn't have to be that way. I don't know how to study for the exam. And people panic. Oh, I've seen so much. I've seen one student panic so much, her hand froze. Her hand physically froze. She could not move it. And um, it goes to show you the hand, the mind-body connection is so strong. All right. So um, I got through my slides. I'm, I'm sorry if it's a little fast on the end there. But let me just open up to any thoughts, comments questions or agreements or disagreements or anything. I'm, I'm open to learning. Does anyone have anything they'd like to add in? Uh, go ahead and type into the chat. Uh, I see a few of you may be typing right now. And um, feel free to uh, raise your hand to speak. We are at the end of our time, so if you need to log out, go ahead and do that. We're going to be wrapping up here shortly. Uh, looks like Jerry Lewis has a comment. So Jerry, what would you like to say? Well, like I put in the chat, <clears throat> I mean, having having lecture capture can help a lot of those students, too. I had one one teacher who here who captured his lectures in his face-to-face -face class and then posted them in his online class on the same subject. But he said to me once that he had he had a, a student who, who for whom English was not her first language. And she said that she watched them over and over again until she understood them. This was math. But, um, but and people have the same objections to or same questions about um, lecture capture, well, what, why, why would the student come to my class 
but the reality is if the student's going to come to your class, they're going to come to your class. If they're not going to come to your class, they're not going to. And maybe at the margins, a few students won't come as often if their lecture captured. But uh, most, most of those students who would come anyway would come if it's lecture captured, so on and so forth. Thank you, Jerry. Jerry, um, what tool do they use to capture lecture? What tool? We are using Panopto, which is available to you and everybody right. in the SBCT system. So yeah, it's it's available to everybody, anybody within this, this SBCTC system to use. Great. Thank you. All right. Does anyone else have anything? Um, if not, I'm going to go ahead and uh, wrap us up for this webinar. So here are some additional resources that you can check out if you'd like to know a little bit more um, about this topic. And um, we are going to get the IGNIS uh, slides posted to the ATL blog as well. And that is also where you will find um, Al's presentation. So um, here's how to contact myself or Jennifer if you need to ask us questions or maybe if you're interested in presenting for us next year or would like to um, give us some comments or feedback, please um, give us a shout out. And then always we conclude our webinars with a survey. I did paste the link into the chat a second ago. Um, here it is again. Um, we'd like some constructive criticism. Let us know how we're doing so we can learn and grow. And uh, that it's a very short survey. takes just a few minutes to do. And then I'd like to wrap us up today with um, an announcement of what we're doing next. So if you will join us next month on April 16th, we'll have um, a faculty learning community from Bates Technical College, and um, they'll be presenting for us on uh, reading strategies for the digital age. And we do have a short break in between uh, this webinar and the next one because we have spring break and the start of a new quarter. So that's why it's going to be in a month instead of in two weeks. So um, great. Thank you for joining us. And um, Thank you all for attending. Thank I you, Al. Uh, yeah, gosh, that was so informative and so fantastic. And you. Um, you totally rocked it, Al. I think you presented a lot of great information. And um, thanks Thank again. So all right. see you all next time, guys. And I'm going to go ahead and turn our recording off. Thanks. Bye now.